Hello, what's poppin? We are on Twitch. We are live. But by the time you see it, we won't be. So just leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK, man. Right behind me, you see it, a warning screen. Loud and present. You see it? I'll give you a moment. Don't forget, um, twitch.com is where you can catch any of the live stream. Just type in this username at the bottom. We also got Patreon where we post five days a week. Five. So not only is there content on YouTube, content on Patreon, there's content on TikTok, there's content everywhere, man. Uh, this is the military show. I don't think we've ever watched them. Why UK has no choice but to go to war with Russia? Wait a minute. Okay, that's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot to unpack here, man. Don't forget, man. Copyright disclaimer under Section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use. And if there's ever anybody that sees any of their, any of their video on there, and they don't want it on there, just leave a comment on it. I'll see it. It's gone. <laughs> Talk to me. It's January 2024, and General Patrick Sanders stands before an audience at the International Armored Vehicles Exhibition in London. However, the general doesn't merely have vehicles on his mind. A much bigger problem troubles him. Russia. During his speech, Sanders stresses that the UK needs to achieve a mental shift, particularly when it comes to the British public and its collective preparedness for war. Conscription still isn't on the table, the general says, but the country's army as it stands right now isn't strong enough. He tells the audience that the UK needs to modernize and may even have to build a citizen army that's ready for a land war. He then delivers a chilling warning. Within the next three years, it must be credible to talk of a British army of 120,000 folding in our reserve and strategic force, but this is not enough. Why will it not be enough? Again, Russia. Sanders speaks. I was just about to, I was thinking that Russia is a pretty big opponent, you know what I'm saying? Now, the UK obviously has some allies, but nevertheless, you know what I'm saying? Each rattles a few cages at 10 Downing Street. Former Prime Minister Rishi Sunak dismisses Sanders' words, saying that presenting hypothetical scenarios isn't helpful to anybody. That especially goes for the General's comments that the Ukraine war has shown that it's not regular armies that win wars, it's citizen armies. The UK should follow in Ukraine's footsteps, he argues, <coughs> or at the very least, be mentally prepared to do so. His message is clear. The UK has no choice but to prepare for war with Russia. And his statements lead to some questions. Why does the UK have to prepare? And just how credible are Sanders' claims? Assuming the general is correct. Right. This, I feel like this is all a surprise to me that this is even brewing. Ugh. How would the UK fare if it faced Russia today? And what, if anything, is it doing to prepare for a war with one of the world's largest militaries? To begin answering those questions, we must first dive into the relationship between the UK and Russia. Both nations have essentially been at peace since the end of the Crimean War and have been allies fighting alongside each other in two world wars. Given that somewhat friendly history, how have relations between the two countries fractured to the point where the UK needs to be ready for war? It all starts with the rise of Vladimir Putin. Putin's rise to the Russian presidency in 2000 marked the end of the cooperative relationship the UK enjoyed with Russia following the end of the Cold War. You know what? I, I'm I'm not surprised. Actually, I do know I do know so I do, I do know something is brewing. I just needed a, a reminder. That end didn't come immediately. Rather, a series of events slowly transformed the relationship from one of cooperation into one of confrontation. Perhaps starting with an infamous incident: the 2006 murder of Alexander Litvinenko, <coughs> a former officer with the federal. I have a documentary. I've had it in my to watch later for two years. Should we watch this? Have you watched this documentary? Security Service, or FSB, Russia's replacement for the KGB, Litvinenko was a Russian spy who had become critical of his country. In 1999, Litvinenko earned the FSB's ire when he claimed that the agency had begun colluding with the Russian mafia and was responsible for several apartment bombings in Russian cities that Russia then used to justify the Chechen war. But perhaps more dangerous to Litvinenko, according to a 2016 report by The Guardian, was that he had a personal vendetta against Putin. 
When Putin became the director of FSB in 1998, two years before he ascended to the presidency, Livinenko met with him to argue against the corruption he saw in the agency. Putin listened to him make his case and did nothing, creating bad blood between the two. It's likely this incident that prompted Litvinenko to leave FSB and flee to Britain in 2000, where it's believed he started working for the MI6 spy agency and developed associations with former Chechen leader Ahmed Zakayev and a Russian oligarch named Boris Berezovsky, both critics of the Kremlin, both enemies of Vladimir Putin. If those associations weren't bad enough, Litvinenko was also not shy about attacking Russia's president. In July, well, he's telling us the whole little story. Though. I might not need to watch the uh, documentary. I'm pretty sure it's more involved, but. In 2006, he wrote an explosive article in which he claimed Putin was a pedophile who had abused his position as the head of FSB in the late 1990s to destroy videotape evidence of himself having sex with underage boys. Add to that further accusations that Putin was responsible for the October 2006 murder of a Russian journalist named. No wonder he's so angry at everybody. It's guilty conscious. You know what? Allegedly is what I... You know what I'm saying? I don't know who you got walking around here. ...named Anna Polikovskaya, and Litvinenko had placed himself on Putin's hit list. It wouldn't be long before Putin enacted his revenge. In November 2006, Litvinenko was killed inside the UK through the use of a poison named polonium-210, which had been administered to a cup of tea. The inquest that followed revealed that Litvinenko was being paid by MI6, though the specific terms of his employment weren't revealed and that he had been targeted by assassins. Specifically, the two men he met for that fateful cup of tea, Andrei Lugovoy and Dmitry Kovtun, were accused of being the men who administered the poison. However, they weren't acting alone. The inquest revealed that Putin likely greenlit the order to kill Litvinenko. The assassination triggered a turning point in UK and Russian... See, this is what I'm talking about, bro. But I'll be saying stuff be like if you really, in the political chain of 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 power in upper echelons or whatever you want to call it, it'd be some crazy stuff going on. What do you mean my tea is poisoned? You can't even get no Earl Grey without dying? relations, with the UK being incensed over the fact that Russia would kill somebody on British soil. In addition, Russia had been uncooperative with the investigation and even refused to extradite one of the suspects. Several Russian diplomats were expelled from the country in response to the killing, along with the UK ending its intelligence cooperation with Russia and freezing some of its assets. If nothing else, the incident showed the UK that Putin was willing to violate the country's laws to get what he wanted. Livinenko's assassination wouldn't be the last time this happened. In March 2018, a Russian double agent named Sergei Skripal was poisoned in the UK. A former officer with Russia's GRU agency, a military intelligence unit, Skripal and his daughter were found slumped on a park bench eight years after arriving in the UK as part of a spy swap deal in 2010. Both survived. Two Russian men, Alexander Petrov and Ruslan Boroshov, were accused of the crime and details soon emerged that demonstrated the covert nature of their attempted assassination. Skripal was poisoned using a Russian-made military-grade nerve agent, with the poison having been applied through the squirt of a perfume bottle. You, you know what? At this point, I'm good. If it's not in a sealed bottle, I don't want it. This is getting real spooky right here in a perfume bottle. So you, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a hazard to smell good. Russia denied all involvement. It claimed that rogue elements had somehow gained access to the nerve agent and had used it without the Kremlin's knowledge. Britain's then Prime Minister Theresa May gave Putin 24 hours to prove his claims, which he failed to do so in the eyes of the British government. By March 2018, the UK was saying that there was no alternative conclusion other than the Russian state was culpable for the attempted murder of Sergei and Yulia Skripal. Another attack on citizens inside the UK, and yet another incident that further soured the relationship between Britain and Russia. The Guardian claimed in 2018 that the incident plunged the relationship between the countries to its lowest depths since the 1980s and the cruise missile crisis. But those relations would reach new depths in February 2022. On February 17, 2022, the UK created new legislation that would give its ministers the power to impose fresh sanctions on Russia's businesses and oligarchs. The decision came in the wake of growing tensions in Europe as Putin appeared to be gearing up to invade Ukraine. 
About a week later, yeah. Russian soldiers started a war that continues to rage to this day. I'm not even gonna lie, you can't even drop a video and if Russia is blocked 100%. If, if I'm talking about a, a music video, like if I do a reaction to somebody's music video, I can see that they have blocked Russia from viewing it. And you can't, nothing. That's deep. The UK joined the rest of the Western international community in condemning the war and used its new powers to levy sanctions. It also began supplying aid to Ukraine, along with many other countries, with Britain's contributions having reached $54.2 billion in value as of July 2024. All of this backstory matters because it paints a picture of the two countries that have experienced continued fracturing of their relationship over the last 24 years. Through his assassination attempts, Putin has shown that he not only lacks respect for the UK and its laws, but that he's willing to deploy agents into the country to get what he wants. He has set a precedent. Russia has operated in Britain before, and it may well do so again. Only this time, those operations would escalate into full-scale war. Assassinations, secret plots, and sanctions combined do not create an atmosphere in which that war would occur. It's what's happened since Russia invaded Ukraine that has led the UK to the point where it needs to prepare. Take the repeated threats from Russia as an example. In February 2024, Russia's former president Dmitry Medvedev commented on the concept of Russia returning to the borders it had in 1991. Doing so would be untenable, claimed Medvedev, who now serves as Russia's Security Council head, as it would mean Russia would have to give up the territory it's taken in Ukraine, as well as Crimea and Chechnya. Speaking happening. on Telegram, a social media platform that's popular in Russia, Medvedev issued a chilling threat. Attempts to return Russia to the borders of 1991 will lead to only one thing, towards a global war with Western countries using the entire strategic arsenal of our state. Medvedev then claimed that any attempt... This is like a, like a real-life IRL soap opera, like, but on a deadly level. ...attempt to return to those borders would represent the West forcing a... Medvedev then claimed that any attempt to return to those borders would represent the West forcing a direct and irreversible collapse of Russia before he built on his strategic arsenal comments. Threats were levied against Kyiv, Washington, Berlin and London, with Medvedev claiming all four have long been included in the flight targets of our nuclear triad. Better to return everything to how Russia wants it, demanded Medvedev, or Russia will return it themselves with maximum losses for the enemy. The context here is simple. Russia would be prepared to use nuclear weapons to strike Britain if the UK takes part in any concerted effort to force Russia to return to its old borders. Suddenly, General Sanders' comments about the need to be prepared are cast in a new light. Perhaps they're not- oh God, it is. Dude is wilding on the Telegram app. See, the Telegram app, they need to cut that off. Anyway. It's a case of scaremongering, but instead the statements of a man who has seen enough to know that Russia is a clear threat. Sanders sees the deterioration of the relationship between Russia and Britain, with Medvedev's nuclear threats only confirming that he's likely right to be worried. Speaking of those nuclear threats, just what would Britain face if Russia pushed the nuclear button? In 2023, the Arms Control Association, or ACA, estimated that Russia has a stockpile of 5,580 nuclear weapons. About 1,200 of these have been retired, meaning they're no longer in active stockpile and are awaiting dismantling. Allegedly. Of course, given that they aren't dismantled yet, those nukes could still be used if Russia felt the need. However, more worrying for Britain are the 1,549 strategically deployed nuclear warheads. These are warheads that are currently installed on ballistic missiles and ready to launch at a moment's notice. It's unknown how many of that 1,549 are directed at Britain. How Just a like... Yeah. Somebody be in that upper echelons could get that mad where they just don't care about nobody no more and press any, do anything. Because, you know, every action has a reaction. So if that's the action, just imagine the reaction from everybody else. It'd be like nothing left. It'd be catastrophic. However, we do know that Russia easily has enough nuclear weapons to level the United Kingdom. In October 2022, the UK-based Sky News ran a report in which it examined the threat that Russia's nuclear weapons pose. General Sir Richard Barons, a British defense expert, is quoted when commenting on Putin's decision to place his nuclear deterrent forces on high alert in March 2022. Speaking about Russia's weapons, he claimed, the warhead at the front of it has a yield between 300 and 800 kilotons. It would take just one of these nuclear weapons to destroy London, Barron says. The UK isn't helpless on the nuclear front. The ACA highlights that it has 224 nukes of its own, 
Plus, it's allied with France and the United States, which are both NATO members and nuclear states that would come to Britain's defense if it was attacked on its own soil. But by that yeah, we got you. point, it would be too late for Britain. Russia has more than enough nuclear weapons to destroy all of the UK's major cities. Of course, these are far from Nevertheless, though, we would spin for the only nuclear threats that Russia has thrown around. It has a long history of using the threat of nukes to try and get its way, dating back to the Cold War era. Yet another nuclear threat, albeit one made in response to the possibility of Russia losing its current borders, may not be enough to convince Britain that it needs to prepare for war. But Medvedev's is far from the only threat made by Russia to the UK. During a state visit to Ukraine in May 2024, former British Foreign Secretary David Cameron committed to delivering at least $3 billion in military aid annually to Ukraine for as long as is required. However, that wasn't the headline from the visit. Instead, it was a single quote that made waves. Just as Russia is striking inside Ukraine, you can quite understand why Ukraine feels the need to make sure it's defending itself. The quote was taken as Cameron's indirect way of permitting Ukraine Three billion? Military aid of three billion? Or what is America giving the something like something something large as well, right? Or it's defending itself. The quote was taken as Cameron's indirect way of permitting Ukraine to do something it had previously been unable to do, use British-provided weapons to attack Russia on its own soil. While Cameron's comments provided room for doubt, further comments made by new British Prime Minister Keir Starmer removed that doubt entirely. Speaking to Bloomberg journalists on July 9, 2024, Starmer claimed that it was up to Ukraine to decide how it would use British weapons, including the long-range Storm Shadow missiles the UK has been sending. Those missiles can travel for 155 miles, far enough for Ukraine to launch them from within its own territory to strike at Russia behind the front lines of the war. Russia was incensed. In the wake of Cameron's comments, Moscow summoned Britain's ambassador to Russia to the foreign ministry to deliver a message. Any strikes made by Ukraine on Russian territory using weapons supplied by the UK would force retaliatory strikes on British military facilities, both in Ukraine and elsewhere. The implication is that elsewhere could mean on British soil. Yet another threat, and yet another justification for General. I ain't gonna lie. How many threats is how many threats, and how much disrespect? See, this is why I couldn't be a leader in that sense of the word because one threat is enough for me personally. If you want, you threaten me once, I believe you, and I gotta act accordingly as just a regular human being. So, General Sanders comments that Britain needs to prepare. The UK didn't backpedal on Cameron's statements in the wake of Russia's threats, with Starmer's July 2024 comments only adding fuel to the fire. Russia argued, I said, dude, you look so shocked. Do you not keep up with this stuff? I don't keep up with it. That's bad, but I don't. This is argues that Britain is needlessly escalating tensions. The UK's refusal to back down means that the threat of war between the two countries is higher than ever. However, it's not just direct threats against Britain that could lead to the UK and Russia going to war. It's Putin's threats against British allies. In January 2024, the British government released a risk analysis that claimed there is a one in four chance that Russia will launch an attack on a British ally within the next two years. That analysis came just days after General Sanders' warnings and the government's shooting down of those warnings, with the report describing Russia as an adversary state throughout. The report claimed that there was a 25% chance of Russia attacking a non-NATO ally, such as Sweden. Of course, Sweden has since become a member of NATO, potentially reducing the possibility of such an attack. But if it were to occur, Britain would find itself going to war not because it was attacked directly, but because it was bound to do so by Article 5 of the NATO Convention. The article essentially states that an attack on one NATO member's soil is treated as an attack on all members, with those who aren't being attacked duty-bound to come to the defense of the country that's being targeted. The message here is simple. Russian aggression toward countries like Sweden, Finland, or the Baltic states of Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia could mean war between Britain and Russia. NATO hasn't lowered these tensions. If anything, it's exacerbated them with the creation of Operation Steadfast Defender 2024. Touted by NATO as the organization's largest military exercise since the Cold War, the joint effort saw 90,000 troops from all of NATO's 32 members converge on Europe to conduct a host of military exercises between January and May 2024. The exercise so basically a show of power to any ops. Exercise. No, this is a show of power.
to let anybody know that that to let everybody know this is what we got, this is what we on. Exercises were split into two parts. First, the United Troops would carry out a series of exercises focused on securing the Atlantic Ocean through to the Arctic Ocean. From there, ground-based troops would move across Europe, traveling from the north of the continent through its center and finally into Eastern Europe. NATO's stated goal was simple – demonstrate the organization's ability to defend every inch of its territory. The message to Russia was also clear, as NATO's exercise was designed to showcase that its forces are ready and waiting to fight should Russia launch an attack on a NATO ally. The UK was among the most heavily involved nations in Operation Steadfast Defense. Which makes sense, though. You know what I'm saying? Like, here, listen, I hear your threats. I see the disrespect. But listen, look at this. And, and make your next move the best move because I want smoke. I got it for you if, you, if it needs to be delivered. I feel it. Like. As it sent 16,000 troops, a little under a fifth of the NATO total, and reinforced its commitment to collective defense. Once again, we see an escalation of tensions. Putin has repeatedly warned NATO nations not to get involved in his war against Ukraine. However, Russia's continued aggression has prompted many NATO nations, including the UK, to take stock of their defensive strategies in preparation for what some see as an inevitable war. This collective escalation could place the UK in a position where it has no choice but to go to war with Russia to support other NATO members. Finally, there's one more suggestion that the UK needs to gear up for war with Russia. Its own people think that war is inevitable. That's according to a YouGov poll conducted in February 2024, which quizzed Britons on whether or not they believed the country needed to get ready for a global conflict. Over half, 53%, believe that there will be another world war in the next 5 to 10 years, with 5 to 10? Oh my. percent claiming that such a war is very likely. Another 38% say that war is somewhat likely, while a further 16% simply don't know one way or the other. On the I, I, I believe like it's it's brewing because there's like certain people in power, but I I don't think five to ten, maybe like twenty five to thirty. Plus side, 44% of those polled believe that the UK and its Western allies would prevail in a war over Russia and its allies, compared to just 13% who think Russia would win. Where does all of this leave the UK? One of its leading generals claims that war is coming. Since 2000, Britain has seen its relationship with Russia deteriorate enormously, to the point where the UK is referring to Russia as an adversary state in official reports. Moscow has levied threat after threat at Britain in 2024, ranging from mentions of nuclear weapons to warnings of strikes on British military facilities and equipment if Ukraine uses British weapons inside Russia. NATO appears to be preparing for war, having conducted one of the largest cooperative exercises ever during the first half of 2024, and Britain would likely be a major part of that war. And as YouGov reveals, most Britons appear to side with General Sanders and his belief that the war is coming. All of which brings us to another question. Is the UK ready to fight Russia? The simple answer appears to be no, or at least it's not ready to fight Russia alone. Every year, Global Firepower, or GFP, compiles a list of 145 countries with militaries, ranking them based on over 60 factors to determine which is the strongest. The United Kingdom performed well in the 2024 version of this list, achieving a ranking of 6th out of 145. The problem is that Russia came second, and it overpowers the UK in practically every department. Russia has 1.32 million active military personnel, compared to 184,860 in the UK. Russia. Jesus. That's, it's not, that's... Okay. It also has over a million more reserve personnel, though the UK comes in with an impressive 924,000. The UK's defense budget is about half of Russia's, and its air force is far smaller, with 664 aerial assets compared to Russia's 4,255. Russia has more tanks, over 130,000 more armored vehicles, and crucially, a navy that contains 664 more assets than the UK's Royal Navy. The last point is important. I'm not. I'm just not believing. I understand all of that. I'm not believing that Russia's navy can 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 put up any type of valuable fight against the, the UK's navy. If we just go on navy for navy, just off the strength of history, like you know what I'm saying. Britain's island status means that a conventional war would require Russia to attack via sea. 
Adding to all of this is the nuclear issue discussed earlier, as Russia has enough nuclear weapons to decimate the UK if conventional warfare doesn't do the job. General Sanders recognizes Britain's comparative weakness. In July 2024, he warned that NATO, and Britain by extension, only had about five years to prepare for war with Russia. Honing in on Britain's defensive capabilities, he praised the UK's ability to combat cyber threats, as well as its ability to defend against terror attacks. But in a full-blown war, it will be found wanting. We have a huge gap in air defenses, the general claims, adding that Britain needs to ensure that its skies are protected with greater investment and that the undersea cables that we rely on are protected from Russian sabotage. In other words, Britain needs to spend more on its military. Which brings us to the final key question posed in the video. What is the UK doing to ensure it's ready for war with Russia? We've already seen some They need to spend more on their military, but they're sending $3 billion overseas to... I mean, I, I get it. It's needed. But where is... That's $63 billion America and the UK combined going to a very valiant and needed situation. But are we sure all of that money is getting where it's supposed to get? Examples, for instance, doing to ensure it's ready for war with Russia. We've already seen some examples. For instance, the UK taking part in Operation Steadfast Defender 2024 is a purposeful effort to reinforce its defensive ties with dozens of other nations. Cooperative defense will form the majority of the UK's strategy against Russia, as it will lean on Article 5 of the NATO Charter to ensure that other powerful nations, such as France, Germany, and the United States, fight alongside it should Russia attack Britain on its own soil. The UK has also been busy signing security partnerships outside of NATO. For instance, 2017 saw it sign a trilateral submarine agreement that also involves the US and France, with 2021 bringing with it a similar agreement between the UK, the US, and Australia. Though these agreements don't compel any of the... So what's Canada doing? Wait, what's Canada doing? So Canada's just chilling? Signees to come to the other's aid in times of war, the fact that they exist at all suggests that Britain will have plenty of allies on which it could rely during a war with Russia. Of course, allies alone won't win a war. The UK needs to prepare in America's giving $175 billion. Internally. It's of course, allies alone won't win a war. The UK needs to prepare internally. It appears to be doing that by committing to the level of investment General Sanders believes is required. In April 2024, Chatham House reported that former Prime Minister Rishi Sunak had pledged to continuously increase Britain's military spending until it reaches 2.5% of gross domestic product, or GDP, by 2030. That would put it above NATO's 2% of GDP guideline, adding an extra £75 billion, or $96 billion, to Britain's defence budget over the next six years. Britain's July 2024 general election initially cast this budget in doubt. However, the Labour Party under Keir Starmer has reiterated Britain's intention to hit a 2.5% of GDP target, meaning military spending has survived a changing government. However, these budgetary increases may not be enough. The Institute of Fiscal Studies points out that the £75 billion pledge only works out if the UK intends to freeze its budget every year between 2024 and 30. In other words, a large amount of that money would have been accounted for within existing increases to UK defence spending, which is already at 2.3% of GDP. Taking that existing commitment into account, rising to 2.5% of GDP only adds £20 billion, around $25 billion, to the budget. While still a large amount of money, most of it will go toward plugging current funding gaps in Britain's military. That means it's having to spend more to play catch-up with Russia rather than spending to strengthen a fighting force that was already capable of winning a war. Never the well, at the end of the day, man, you got to get your you got to get your you got to get your ground level right so you can build on it. You need your foundation strong. So do what you got to do. Make it quick, though. Nevertheless, the UK don't sit here and twiddle your fingers until the last minute. ...has been ordering and building more weapons since the outbreak of the Ukraine war. December 2022 saw it spend almost $300 million on thousands of next-generation light anti-tank weapons, or NLAWs, from Swedish manufacturers. This not... I'm not... I'm, is that a lightsaber? 
after a sense of next-generation light anti-tank weapons, or NLAWs, from Swedish manufacturer Saab. NLAWs can destroy a modern tank from a distance of up to 2,600 feet and would prove extremely effective in a... So this is like a, a missile? What is this? ...ground war, given Russia's demonstrated reliance on tanks in Ukraine. A further $115 million was committed to buying L403A1 assault rifles, which feature stronger optical sighting systems than Britain's current That's nice. rifles, as well as a muzzle signature reduction system. The UK government website suggests that up to 10,000 of these rifles may be purchased between 2023 and 33. Forces.net also reported that the UK is investing in drones capable of firing bullets costing as little as 13 cents per round in May 2024. The point here is that the UK is spending the money it has intelligently. It's seen Russia's extensive use of tanks in Ukraine and is investing in NLAWs and drones due to the success Ukraine has enjoyed with both. Purchasing new rifles also means Britain's soldiers would likely be better equipped than Russia's on the battlefield. However, it likely needs to spend more and faster if General Sanders' prediction of a conflict within five years is true. Right now, Britain's navy doesn't match Russia's in sheer size, even given the fact that much of the Russian navy is made up of patrol boats and smaller warships. Its aerial forces, as Sanders points out, are also not at the level they need to be to establish aerial dominance against Russia. Help from its allies could bolster the UK. But if it's to win against Russia, it likely needs to do more. That may mean an even greater commitment to spending, as well as increasing cooperation with its allies to ensure that collective defense is really what it's touted to be if Russia's aggression extends to Britain's shores. But what do you think? Does the UK really need to prepare for a war with Russia? Listen, I think that was very informal, but at the same time, it's a little bit spooky, man, to know that this dude is over there. I feel like he's like a loose cannon. Like he just, just, you got to step into the rest of the world and stepping on eggshells because, all right. Tell a little like, comment, let me know what you think.